Last year, I made Loki read Burned. I mean, she was writing bad poetry anyway, so I figured, here, have Burned. There's only one of them. You know, she'll stop writing bad poetry, get distracted, and then it'll be over because there's only one of them. Well, I was wrong. Because Ellen Hopkins wrote another one. I didn't want anything to do with it because honestly, there's only so much farm drama, cougars, and evil cults that I can take. But Loki harassed me about smoke. She made a vlog, she texted me, she phoned me. But I always had the same reaction. I'll get to it when I get to it because honestly, there are a whole bunch more books I'd rather be reading right now. And that's when things started to get a little weird. And weirder. And weirder. It got to the point where I couldn't ignore her anymore. I had two options. I could commit her to an insane asylum, something that seemed more and more likely, or I could just read the damn book. So, what'd you think? The people and then the, the terrorists and then the people and like... Ugh. So, before we get started, I just want to throw this up there. Let me set the scene. Burn ended with Peyton swearing that she was going to get a gun and make all of those people who helped kill Ethan pay. It was memorable, it was dark, and it let you draw your own conclusions to the text. But the beginning of Smoke manages to take all that memorable part of Burn and butcher it. We are thrown into the beginning of Smoke where Peyton and her sister are reeling because Peyton shot their father and he is now dead as a doornail. Who actually thought she would go through with it? So Peyton flees from her family and figures that the police are going to arrest her eventually, so why doesn't she just go and see the ocean? So she hops on a bus and immediately runs into another woman-hating asshole. After saving another girl from this woman-hating asshole, she's taken in by a family of illegal Mexican immigrants. And this family then finds her job as a live-in housemaid at a giant farm in California. And while Peyton is playing live-in housemaid, we're treated to the perspective of her sister Jackie, who was there when her father was shot, and she has to work her way through her own set of issues. Jackie was raped by a Mormon boy in their community, and when her father found out, he blamed it on Jackie. He was in the process of beating Jackie to death when Peyton walked in and shot him. Jackie is left dealing with her emotional trauma while stuck living with a mother who's hell-bent on denying her sexual assault. And Jackie's also stuck looking after her five or six other siblings. We're left with two different narratives, Jackie's and Peyton's, that reach the same ideological conclusions at about the same time. So our first observations about this book. This plot is insane. It's all over the place. It's a mess. It has a lot going on. It's fantastical, sensational, dramatized. And keep in mind, this is a book whose major themes are redemption, violence against women, and emotional trauma. Last time we had farm drama. This time we have slightly less farm drama and immigration issues thrown into the mix. Last time we had a car chase and a terrible accident. This time we have terrorists. The script says terrorists. This feels like fan fiction. Does this feel like fan fiction to you? Yes. Yes, it does. But it's not just the ridiculous drama that gets in the way of this book, once again. It's also the fact that the author is willing to sacrifice believable characters for expediency. Like the villain Deirdre, you know, because every good drama needs a blatant over-the-top villain. She is Peyton's employer's teenage daughter. She's horrible, she's terrible, and she's a dangerous person. And she hangs out with anarchists. Why? Because reasons. I mean, this book is supposed to be realistic, so why would the villain have something as trivial as a backstory? Out of everything in this book, she's the most over-the-top, dramatic, laughable, and completely out of place. And then there are the two love interests who are there to provide redeeming love for the two sisters, but they're so cookie-cutter. Jackie gets Gavin, a sweet and nerdy tutor, who suddenly, after spending five minutes with her, is surprised 
in love with her and wants to make all her problems go away. Gavin has a bit of a backstory about why he's strong against bullying and peer pressure. The author does put a little bit more effort into his story rather than Angel's. Like, that's not a heavy-handed name. Peyton gets Angel, who pretty much has three identifying features. He is technically an illegal immigrant, he's kind, and he loves Peyton. Ta-da! Peyton swore through her teeth that she would never love anyone other than Ethan. And though I don't care enough to go back and check this in Burnt, I swear she said, you only get one forever love. I mean, it's forever love. Forever love. Ellen Hopkins loves things are part of the problem. But forever love! Peyton has based her sense of self-worth on being loved by Ethan. She comes home and burned and teaches her sister the same thing. Only, it doesn't work out so well for Jackie. Her quest for self-worth through love ends up leading her to her rapist instead. Even by the end of the book, the girls haven't learned to find their own self-worth without love. Peyton is built back up by Angel's love, and Jackie gets Gavin to tell her that she is a wonderful human being. And we're not trying to say that having somebody to lean on in a time of crisis is a bad thing. We're just saying that the girls probably never would have managed to survive without their forever loves. And it seems like no matter how much they try, they can never find their self-worth on their own. If there are any good moments in this novel, they are with Jackie. Despite the convenient love interest, Jackie has a larger emotional range than Peyton does. And she has some very serious barriers that she has to go through, and you would have a difficult time dealing with them. The major failing of this novel is basically that Peyton's story has nowhere to go. In her burn story, Peyton's life sucks. She goes and moves in with her Aunt Jay. She meets Ethan, falls in love, her life is awesome again. But then she moves in with her parents, her life sucks. She gets pregnant, her boyfriend dies, she swears ultimate revenge. There's really nowhere for their story to go anymore. With Smoke, it's kind of like the name suggests. It's murky, it's there, and it's really annoying. Even though Burned was its own brand of ridiculousness, there was always a sense of dread to the novel. You knew that it was going to end badly. You didn't know how bad, but you knew it was going to suck. With Smoke, well... How much worse can her life really get? Exactly! The book is full of conflicts, but it's written when the antagonists have all the depth of a mustache-twirling villain in an Old West movie. Yes, Smoke exposes young readers to difficult, tough issues. In Burned, we had to deal with Mormon cult mentality, physical abuse, teen pregnancy, and cancer. While in Smoke, we had to deal with illegal immigrants, sexual abuse, terrorism, and negative portrayals of homosexuality. Smoke is trying to do too much with too little. The narrative exists to throw all these issues in your face. Look how bad it is! I'm making a point! Death is sacrificed for heavy-handedness, and if Smoke offered a solution to the problems it was raising, instead of just parading them in front of you, it would be less of a soap opera, and the reader could connect to the characters. <sighs> so there. You got me to read it. What did that achieve? Forever love. Da-da-da!